I know that you love videos about Starship and I've had some great live streams recently with Angry Astronaut and Dr. Phil Metzger, a planetary scientist. So I wanted to make this video to give you some updates about the next flight and also take some of the best clips from both of those live streams. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Here. The has now, SpaceX recently confirmed in this video that Ship 25 and Booster 9 will definitely be the next combo for the upcoming second Starship orbital test flight. Another new addition to Starbase is the leadership of Kathy Leaders, who began reporting down at Starbase and working with SpaceX from NASA about three weeks ago. I mean, Kathy Leaders. Uh you know, wouldn't have taken this job if there wasn't something tangible developing with HLS. And HLS was kind of that and commercial crew was kind of her baby when she was at NASA. Um, she's the one who wrote the uh, the report, the, the findings that NASA had when they decided to go with Lunar Starship and HLS. So she has a personal interest uh, invested in this. And the fact that she has decided to now lead the program that she recommended um, at SpaceX, that's kind of unique. Um, I don't think any any former NASA employee has tried to do something like that before on this kind of level. Um, so yeah, taking the bull by the horns and, and seeing to it that this thing lands on the moon. So not only is that encouraging in terms of getting Starship, you know, the fact that Lunar Starship will be a successful program, but also given the importance that it represents to NASA, that in, you know encourages me that there's going to be some powerful forces at work seeing to it that Starship will launch again from Boca. We've also noticed that some lunar Starship components have been arriving, or at least that's the speculation that they are related to the lunar Starship to Starbase. I mean, they, they can pretty easily point out all the components that they're used to seeing. And now all of a sudden in the immediate aftermath of Kathy being hired there, they have all these mystery components. I think there's, and, and they're not, parts of the of the uh water cooled plate or anything like that they don't bear any resemblance to that um so that you know is leading people to believe that we've got something else going on now angry says if spacex had waited for that water cooled steel plate to be ready he really thinks that they could have possibly made it all the way to the coast of Hawaii. And also, yeah, I have been very harshly critical of the launch on April 20th. I think that that SpaceX should have waited at least until they got that, you know, that plate in place, the water cooled plate, you know, take a couple of precautions because by doing what they did, they gave those environmental groups the ammunition they needed to, to start a lawsuit. They were itching for some ammunition and they got the ammunition that they were looking for. And, and that's too bad because it, you know, there, if it had gone more smoothly, um, then they wouldn't have had a lake to stand on. And now they do. Well, and you've thought that maybe if they had the plate in time, they could have potentially succeeded on all of the objectives they were trying to accomplish with that first launch. Do you still stand by that? Oh yeah. I mean, look at, look at, I mean, once again, we don't know, or at least I don't know. And most of the public doesn't know about why we had the engine failures when we did. Right. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, that, that was that concrete maelstrom that was created had that not existed. Yeah. Then the rocket wouldn't have sustained nearly as much damage and it might've been able to achieve orbit. Of course, scientists are still studying the aftermath especially with this pending environmental lawsuit of the launch, we all know that the pad pretty much exploded into these concrete chunks and fondag. And Dr. Phil Metzger, who is a planetary scientist, has been receiving samples and studying not only the concrete chunks, but also the dust. So here are some of his findings. I did get people to send me samples from Boca Chica, samples of the sand-sized particles and dust-sized particles that rained down five or six miles away in Port Isabel. So people have swept up some of those samples and mailed them to me in baggies, and we're currently doing analysis. Of okay. The Do you have any takeaways that you can share yet, or are they still, you're still- oh, Yeah, I can tell you what we've done so far. Um, I'm gonna, by the way, I am gonna try to publish a paper on this, on this analysis, and all the people who did the field work, collecting the samples, 
and um, giving the context information and sending it. They're all going to be co-authors. And so I'm really excited about this as a citizen science activity. Um, but what, what we've done so far is um, we've measured the particle size distribution of all this material. And we've shown that um, most of the particles were between 10 and 500 microns in size, which means they're not a breathing hazard. Um, but there were some particles below 10 microns in size. Those would be a breathing hazard, except it was so little that it really wasn't. Um, so that, that answered the questions that a lot of reporters had. You know, it was not, not a hazardous thing. I mean, it would be a nuisance to have sand falling down on your car. You got to sweep right. up, up batch in the bank, you know, but that was pretty much it. Um, so we've settled that question, um, but we're still trying to understand exactly what is this material that rained down five or six miles away. Because when a rocket exhaust blows sand, it shouldn't go that far. Um, on Mars, where the air is thinner, it goes farther. But the thing that goes the farthest is gravel, because it has more ballistic coefficient. It's got the inertia to go farther in the air. Um, and it only goes 700 meters, you know, less than a kilometer. So for particles um, all the way from below 10 microns up to 500 microns to go five or six miles, that's really just surprising. And, and we think it's going to give us some insight into how rocket exhaust interacts with geo materials. Um, hmm. so, we're, so we're still um, working on the analysis of what these particles exactly are. We're, we're going to do um, Raman spectroscopy. Uh, there's a researcher in Houston who's going to do that and will be a co-author on this work. Um, we're in the University of Central Florida. We're doing infrared and visible spectroscopy. And then we're comparing that to the concrete chunks. There were like five different kinds of concrete that were blown right. out onto the beach. And so we're, we're going to compare to these and hopefully that'll give us insight into exactly what is this sand? Was it the was it the fondag? You know, was it the material directly under the pad or was it material farther out or maybe right. below the fondag? And so that should give us some insight into how that landing pad or launch pad broke apart. And um, that could give us some insight into the models we're developing for landing on the moon and Mars. The sand samples came a while back and then okay. we later on realized we needed to measure some concrete too. So I put out a request on Twitter and about two or three different people are sending pieces of concrete and fondag. Wow. So they sent me pictures and one, some of them look like the one you have there, but yeah, there were also yeah. some fondag, which is much darker and finer. Right. It doesn't have the large aggregate pieces like what you just had in your hand. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah now, someone, I, someone sent me this too. So we have generous people. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's kind of historic, right? You want to keep it. I promised everybody I'm going to send their samples back because it's pretty historic. I think oh, we, wow. may never, we may never have a launch pad blown apart like that ever again. You know, it was like the one and only time. I don't know where the SD card is, unfortunately. Now, Starship has a long way to go before we actually make it to Mars. But one of the biggest hurdles that Angry says Starship will face is figuring out that orbital refueling in low earth orbit. Oh yeah. It's going to be a lot more difficult um, to, to that's, that's a big technical hurdle and something that we have never done before, especially on this scale. Of course, if we want to go to Mars, we not only have to figure out how to get there, but how to stay there and how to even make life possible on Mars. That's why I was so excited to interview Dr. Metzger, who actually has been studying and thinking about this topic for many decades now. He gave a TED Talk almost 10 years ago about why we should put robots on Mars, and that is looking more and more likely today with the development of Tesla Bot. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. We're in the middle of a robotics revolution, and of course, artificial intelligence has been all, in all the news and social media for a while because of the advances there. And those are really going to revolutionize how we live and work in space because um, you'll be able to have, have ro robots carrying more of the load, doing right. the construction to build landing pads and build habitats, doing the mining and resource extraction to make rocket propellant and to make consumables that humans need for living in space. And um, that way humans can focus on doing things that humans are best at 
you know, being humans and doing the things that that make our world so rich. So um, so I'm looking forward to continued advances in this field. I kind of feel like without the robots, it's almost not feasible. Do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Um, back in the 1970s through 1990s, Gerard K. O'Neill was talking about his vision for having big rotating cylinders in space with 10,000 people living in each cylinder. Um, and they would be doing mining and manufacturing in order to make space-based solar power to beam energy down to the earth to make a product to sell so that they could buy things from the earth right so that way they would be able to support living in space but in order to make that model work you had to have 10,000 people living in space before it can start to break even right. you know so who's going to pay out of pocket to build this big gigantic 10,000 person habitat you know not even the richest people in the world can afford that so it was pretty much a non-starter back in the 70s through 90s congress said no we're not going to do that crazy stuff um but now with robotics it's not crazy it's um, very doable and we're working on uh, strategies to uh the, the pathways that we'll need to follow to get there and those pathways are very credible and so i think it's going to happen I was happy to take some questions from the audience during my live stream with Dr. Metzger. And one of the questions from Wicked One Show is, what kind of systems and technologies will we need for actually colonizing Mars? Um, a lot of the technologies we're developing can work on any of these planetary bodies, maybe about 70% crossover. So um, what we're doing on the moon is, is, we call it Mars forward. NASA calls it that. So it's um, technologies that you can push forward to the next planet. So um, we're working on extracting oxygen and carbon from the atmosphere of Mars. We're working on mining water, which is valuable for the moon and Mars. And then how do you clean up the water? Because it's not pure drinking water. It's got um, heavy metals mixed in and other ice like carbon dioxide ice. So um, the, the we've had groups around the country and around the world working on these technologies and it's mostly funded by government space agencies but um the private space companies are self-funding some of that work as well I, I recently did an economic study of settling mars i haven't published it yet just because i don't have time it was unfunded research and i just have to do it on my own time but um i'm surprised how realistic it is to to build a city on mars i didn't expect that result but um, the economics, when you go big, it turns out it's, it's a lot easier than trying to do these small missions like what NASA does. Hmm. So if you go big, you know, hundreds of people at a time on Mars, shipping ha factory hardware, it actually comes out reasonably affordable. It's like within 15 years, the total cost of, of the settlement will divided by the number of settlers is less than the amount I owe on my house. So. I mean, so that's doable, right? It's doable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, you just need to float the expenses for this for 15 years. And I, I calculate how much, and it's clearly in Elon Musk's affordable <laughs> range. You know, I, I think, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm a little more optimistic than Elon is um, after wow. all the study. But, um, but here's the thing. Um, the hardest part of it is going to be making life as comfortable as it is for us now. Because yes. that means we've got to have a lot of sophisticated stuff like iPhones. And making an iPhone is like the pinnacle of industrial development. Um, the easy stuff will be making breathing air and drinking water. That's the easy part. And, you know, that's the only thing that makes it different than life on Earth. Um, you got to make the air. You got you to gotta mine the water and, and melt it and clean it up. And you got to live under a dome, you know, that's supposedly the hard part. But in economically, that's actually the easy part. And hmm. um, we, the cost of doing that is such a small part of the whole economy that you can easily absorb that cost simply by, let's say, let's say that you live under a big giant dome. So you don't need cars, right? You're not going to need cars on Mars for the first 50 years. So get rid of the whole automotive industry. All the money that would have gone to cars easily pays for living under a dome and making, you know, cleaning up the soil for agriculture and, you know, 
So it's not going to be as hard as people think it is once you go big. Dr. Metzger informed me of a scale that I hadn't heard of before, a technology readiness scale that goes from one to nine for NASA to determine what kind of technologies are actually ready to be tested in space. One means you've got some new idea from physics. TRL2 means I know how to turn that into a technology and apply it. TRL3 means you've done the laboratory test to show that the basic idea works. TRL4 means that you've actually built pieces of it, the, the critical components, and you've tested them and you've measured how effective they are and you've done the modeling to show, yeah, this application is actually going to work in a, in a way that makes it worthwhile. And then TRL5 means you've built some rough prototypes and demonstrated them. TRL6 means you've built high fidelity prototypes. You've tested them in a relevant environment. So TRL1 through 6 is what you have to do before you can send something into space. Okay. Um, once you've committed to sending it into space, seven means you've built the qualification units. You've done all the shake and bake, you know, the thermal vibe tests. Um, and you've qualified that particular design. TRL eight means you've now built the test art, the flight article, and you've performed its pre-flight checkout. And then TRL nine means it's flying in space. So TRL one through nine, it's a very convenient system. We use it all the time. So most of these technologies are now between TRL three and TRL five. Uh, okay. Some some are at TRL six. We've done tests on volcanoes, reduced gravity aircraft, and vacuum chambers. So some have been tested in a relevant environment, but most of them are TRL three to six, I mean three to five. Five is pretty good. If you're at TRL five, then you're ready for a big infusion of funding to do the the big high fidelity test and then commit to flying it. So. Um, so that's where we are right now. We're working up the TRL scale. Of course, the trip to Mars is going to be long and probably not that enjoyable. And there are hazards while on Mars, including radiation and lack of gravity. So here's what Dr. Mesker had to say about those two very real concerns. What you just said kind of leads into the next question from Alan. What can be done to mitigate some of those harder problems like the lack of gravity and radiation, both during the trip and once on Mars? Yeah, so um, gravity, there's not a lot you can do about that. You know, Mars has three eighths of Earth's gravity and it always will. <laughs> so there's not much we can do there. Um, but um, we don't know yet if, if that's going to be harmful to human life. I think probably it's not going to be that bad because it's it's not an order of magnitude less than Earth gravity. It's still within, you know, still within 60 percent or something of Earth's gravity. So um, that's not bad. Um, and I've done reduced gravity flights. I've done zero G. I've done lunar gravity and I've done Martian gravity. And I'll be honest, Martian gravity was disappointing because it felt like Earth. Um Lunar gravity, you, you feel like you're buoyed up and you bounce a lot, you know, but Mars gravity, after doing, you know, 40 parabolas of lunar, then going to 10 parabolas of Mars, it's like, oh, okay, well, this feels a lot more like Earth gravity. So with that anecdotal evidence, I don't think it's going to be that, that bad, you know, with medical interventions, with, with lots of exercise to keep your body healthy, I think the gravity may be doable. Um, radiation, that's a bigger problem, I think. Um, so the, the really the only way to stop the radiation is to have a lot of mass over your head. Here on the Earth, we have this thick atmosphere. If you were to condense the, all the mass of the atmosphere down into a solid, it would be about 10 meters thick of sand. Wow. It would be that much mass. So it's like living under 10 meters of soil over your head, right. blocking the radiation. So, so one technique is to go underground. And if you go underground 10 meters, then it's the same as life on Earth. But 10 meters is a lot of a lot of dirt to put over the top of your habitat. And um, so we really don't want that much. But most most studies show that you don't really need 10 meters of shielding. Um, you could get by with maybe two meters, maybe one meter. Um, and then especially with medical intervention like dietary and, and drugs that counteract the radiation effects. So there may be other ways to deal with this. Um, but um, most people think that 
on Mars, we're going to have domes. Um, the domes can be designed to let the light in and yet still not have a direct view to space so that, um, so that it blocks the radiation. Um, and you can go outside and drive around in rovers and walk in your spacesuit, but you need to keep track of how often you do that so that your lifetime dose doesn't get too high. By the way, every time you fly in, an, in a jet aircraft from Miami to Los Angeles, because you're higher above the surface of the Earth, you're getting outside of some of that shielding. And you get the equivalent of one chest X-ray of radiation every time you take that trip. But it's not that bad. You know, your body can handle that. You know, your body has mechanisms to repair radiation damage. Wow. Um, if you happen to be flying when there's a solar flare, you might get 10 times that much radiation or even on a large solar flare, 100 times. Wow. And so, so pilots and airline attendants have little badges they carry on their body that measure their dose. And they have a lifetime career dose limit and they track it. So, so people on Mars will have to do that. You know, just wear your little radiation tag, keep track of your dose, and keep it below acceptable limits. So I, I think that's the way we'll probably handle it. So thank you for watching this video. It's been a minute since I've actually taken the time to edit something fully and put down some B-roll, but I definitely want to have a mix of live streams and also edited videos. I'm hoping to take more trips soon once my leg is recovered so that I can get that uh in the field on the ground reporting for you boots on the ground is what i like to call it so hopefully you'll be able to join me for those but thank you for supporting the channel ellie and space i really appreciate your support and hopefully you can make it to some of my live streams because i definitely plan to do more of those in the future mm -hmm.